Welcome to the Revelation Code. I'm your host, Suzanne, and I want you to stay with us over the next 30 minutes for an in-depth look into the world of prophecy and how it affects your life today. Whether you believe in prophecy or not, the prophetic words in the Bible are coming true daily. Wars and rumors of wars, nations rising up, and the rise of famine and sickness all point to the end of time the Bible talks about. How close are we to the end of days? And what will happen in our lifetime? Stay tuned, you're about to find out. Today on the Revelation Code. Here's the thing. In the year 2015, there will be two solar eclipses. The sun will be darkened twice. But the interesting thing is, each time it will mark something. When that first one happens in the springtime, it's going to mark the day that is the exact center point of the year of the Shemitah. The second eclipse is going to come on Elul 29, the day of wipeout. Now, this is every single account in, in the world, every transaction, everybody investing, everybody, all their whims and hunches, all are part of the equation. So every single thing had to be exactly right. If you invested in the stock market, that was part of the equation that God put it all together on the exact moment. And in fact, the one in 2001 was actually caused by 9-11. So what that means is that even 9-11 had to be part of the mystery. The two greatest crashes. And could there be fingerprints on these crashes? Well, you know, in the, in the Shemitah, the mystery is focused on the number seven. Could there be fingerprints here? Well, here you have how much was wiped out in 2001? How much percent of Wall Street? Seven percent. How much was wiped out in 2008? 7%. How much, remember what caused that crash? There was that, that bailout they rejected from Congress. How many, how much money? 700 billion. How many points were wiped out that day in 2008? 777. Did you notice something? Seven, seven, and seven. Only God, only God. He is in charge of everything. And now we come to the future. The next Shemitah is no longer the next Shemitah. It has just begun. Generally, I've shared this a long time before, that generally when it begins, you don't notice a lot of things, but usually it happens without anybody noticing it, but it's as it progresses that it gets more and more intense. That's what happened in the last ones. When it happened in 2007, you wouldn't notice anything, but within, but on that day came the first bank crash that was a symbol, a foreshadow of what was going to happen at the end of the Shemitah. And on, in that month, the stock market began to turn around from its rise and began to fall. Now, interesting. So I wonder, is there going to be a first fruit? Well, on the day it began, it began on my birthday this year, but when the Shemitah began, Wall Street plunged, I don't know if you caught it, almost 300 points. It was like a shadow of something. And they couldn't explain why it did. But it was always like a first fruit. What lies ahead? First caution. I don't want to be dogmatic. I don't set dates where God has not. God doesn't have to do anything. You know, you can't put God in a box. Most people, when they tell you what this was going to happen, it doesn't happen most of the time. The mystery doesn't have to manifest every cycle. It can be less one cycle, stronger another. But the second caution is, God doesn't have to, but he could. I don't set dates, but the book contains dates to be aware of. But we have note that the phenomenon is intensifying. And there is one harbinger in the book that is the last harbinger to be finished. It's called The Tower. How many people read The Harbinger again? So I could just, if, how many people haven't? Okay, get out. I'm, I'm kidding, <laughs> kidding, 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 kidding. This is for you. <laughs> this is for you. The last harbinger that is being done is called the tower. The tower. 
When you go back to the ancient scripture of the harbinger, when there was this first warning on Israel, and this first attack on Israel, and the people said, we're going to rebuild higher, bigger, stronger, we're going to defy God, we're not going to be humbled by God. What happened is, in the, in the ancient Greek Septuagint, they translated it very strangely. They, they said, instead of saying, the bricks have fallen, Isaiah says it, Isaiah 9, 10, the bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with you and so on. They said this, they said, the bricks have fallen, come let us build for ourselves a tower. On ground zero, what is happening? A tower is rising. And I didn't know this. They got that verse. They, the rabbis got this thing from Babel. It's from Babel. Come let us build our ta a tower. They got it from Babel and they put it on Isaiah 9:10, the harbinger scriptures. And so what, so here this, I didn't know when I wrote the harbinger, I didn't know that there was a scripture hidden in ground zero. And the scripture that was in ground zero, it was, a, it, was a, it was a Bible. It was like one page you could see. It had been charred apart. A guy took a picture. The official photographer took, so, takes a picture, and they whisk him out. And then he looks at his camera and sees what it is, and he, start, he breaks down weeping. What was the scripture? The scripture was, come let us build for ourselves a tower. The scripture from Babel, and that identified Isaiah 9, 10, the harbinger scripture. So this tower is rising in the Bible. This, I mean, any, and this, this was to be a symbol of defiance. America, we're going to defy it all. When Israel did it, it led to its destruction. But here it is rising, rising there, still not finished. And after the harbinger came out, the, Obama, the president, went down to ground zero. And they showed him the final beam of the tower. And they said, put words on the beam. It's going to be the highest beam. It's going to be the fit, clap, crowning touch. And so he can do anything he wants. What does he put on there? He puts on there the, um, an, a, a modern prose version of Isaiah 9:10, the harbinger scripture. Without realizing he's even doing it, he's paralleling. In fact, you know, when, when, when the ancient leaders of Israel said these words, they pronounced judgment on the nation. But in Hebrew, Isaiah 9:10 is not many words, it's only eight words, eight Hebrew words destroyed or led to their destruction. The president writes eight words that parallel the eight Hebrew words. In fact, some of them are like, one in the center is word for word. And it's going to be the highest words, and it's going to, words of defiance are going to crown that tower. When the president was inaugurated the second time, he chose a poet to give a poem, and that poet gave a poem to give praise, but it wasn't to give praise to God. He said, we're going to praise the works of our hands. And at the end, and, he, and then he starts speaking about the tower, the harbinger. And he speaks, he says, as this, as this, we give that, he says, as this, this tower goes up, it, it shows our resilience and even heaven yields before it. Or the sky is yielding to our resilience. You know, it was, I believe it was around last year, they finally put, they tried to put the, they had a spire to put on top of that tower to crown it. And they, they tried to go up, but the wind beat them down. They couldn't do it. So then later on, finally, they went up again on a different day. They put it up. And the day they put it up, interesting, you know, the Bible gives, speaks of a sign in the heavens that it's a sign of, that can be of judgment. doesn't mean every time it happens it's judgment, but it can be. They put up the tower and the sun was darkened. It was a solar eclipse on that day. That tower, it was conceived in the year of the Shemitah. It was spoken into existence when the leaders of America gathered on Capitol Hill and one of them said the ancient prophecy, Isaiah 9, 10, of judgment and said, we will rebuild. That was the beginning of that tower. It was born by that scripture of judgment. And it looks like it's going to be completed in the year of the Shemitah. I would keep my eyes on that tower. I'd keep my eyes on, I'm not being dogmatic, but I would keep my eyes about when that thing is finished. I would look at that. I would also keep my eyes on the where America is going when it reaches these thresholds. We just said, just today, the Supreme Court made a major non-decision that opened the door for more. Well, I would watch that as well. And people have asked me about the blood moons. Without being dogmatic, I'll say this. The period of the blood moons is one and a half years. The first half is gone. The rest that is left over is the Shemitah. The blood moons of the Shemitah are coming together. 
But I, noted, I, I made a note that one of the signs in the Bible of judgment says the sun shall be darkened. And again, I'm not saying that every eclipse means that, but it can. So here's, here's the thing. In the year 2015, there will be two solar eclipses. The sun will be darkened twice. But the interesting thing is, each time it will mark something. When that first one happens in the springtime, it's going to mark the day that is the exact center point of the year of the Shemitah. The second eclipse is going to come on Elul 29, the day of wipeout. The sun will be darkened. Now, now listen, the last time that that happened, that there was a solar eclipse on Elul 29 of the Shemitah, you know what it was? It was 1987. It ushered, it ushered in Black Monday, the greatest percentage crash in Wall Street. Another time it happened, or it happened right, right at the end of Elul 29, in, the, in, the, in Tishri 1, the Great Depression. And when that happened, that eclipse happened on the day, you had the greatest month collapse in history. Interesting because this year, it's going to happen. And I'm not saying God, again, has to do it, but he can. But I'd be aware things could happen before, after, or whatever. And, but, but, Elul 29 will fall on a Sunday. That means the stock market's not open. But a few things about that. Number one, the last day that the stock market will be open, so that's going to be the closing number that's going to go into the whole weekend. The date is 9-11. 9-11. But also it can point that the, what's going to happen, what can happen in America could be greater than an economic or financial shaking. You know, do you want me to, I mean, I'm, I'm giving you a lot. Do you want, should I give you a little bit extra? I mean, because I don't, I'm not, I, I'm trying to get, I mean, we're near, near getting to near the end of the, about the, but I'll, I'll just throw this in. I'm going to throw this in. <clears throat> this is recent. I was in, I was in the Capitol building on, Sept on September 10th. I was speaking to members of Congress. There are believers on Capitol Hill. And they were praying. And they asked me to proclaim intercede for America from the, from the Capitol. And we we're praying together. But that same night, the president got up in, white, in the White House and made a declaration of war. Interesting thing, in the harbinger, one of the harbingers is the second harbinger is the, called that of the terrorist. That the first strike that comes on the land is done by masters of terror. And that is the Assyrians, ancient Assyrians. They are the inventors of terrorism. They are the ones who, you can read any history on it, they invented terror. And so here they, here they are, they did this, and then years later when Israel didn't turn back, there came, there is, the Assyrians returned to the land, but this time it wasn't a little thing, it wasn't a temporary attack, it was destruction across the land. So I always wondered, and I'm not saying it has to happen according to the exact way, but I always wondered, would there be another engagement of America and the terrorists? And that would be ominous and chilling if it was. Because in ancient times, the same people who did 9-11, or that first strike rather, they ended up bringing the big destruction. So it, when this thing with ISIS began, ISIS, you know that, first of all, they are a breakaway of Al-Qaeda, the, the ones who did 9-11. Secondly, their key place is Syria and Iraq. Syria and Iraq is the core of one ancient empire, the Assyrians. Same place they are claiming, they just took over Nineveh, the Assyrian Empire. And they are the people from that area. They are even more than Al-Qaeda. They are linked to the Assyrians. That's the people of the Harbinger. And so they've returned. And that says, the Assyrians were known for being cold-blooded. So ISIS. The Assyrians used to mutilate people. Particularly, they would decapitate them. And then they would, after decapitating them, they would put them on display. ISIS decapitates and puts on display. And so now we are re-engaged with these terrorists. And the president makes his declaration on September 10th, which is 9-10, which is like the scripture, which is Isaiah 9-10, is we will, we will, we will come back stronger. It was the eve of 9-11. And when the president makes the speech, he refers to two events. He says, but you know, we basically, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, we've been shaken by two events. And he says, this is the 13th anniversary of 9-11. That's the first one. And then, as the harbinger speaks of two shakings, then he says, and then six years ago, we, another shaking is talking about the economic collapse. That's a seven-year cycle. 
And when you go one more seven cycle, the six becomes seven and the 13 becomes 14. That's the next Shemitah. He makes that on, on the eve of 9-11. Well, 9-11 will be the last day the stock market's open before the Shemitah, the day of the last day of the Shemitah. What do we believe? What might the Shemitah bring? The Shemitah causes the worldly realm to fall, to be shaken, to collapse, and it turns, it's to turn people back to God. That God is sovereign over all things. It humbles the pride of man. It, causes, it can cause the fall of great nations, even superpowers, and the rise of others. Now, whether it happens during this Shemitah or not, I will say this. I believe a great shaking is coming to America and to the world, but America and the world. And this shaking will involve the collapse of the financial realm, the economic realm, and will not necessarily be limited to those realms at all. The point of the Shemitah and the point of the shaking is to cause those who will hear to return to the Lord, to repent and be saved, and those who know the Lord to awake. For when the mountains and hills are cast down, the valleys are lifted up, says the Lord, to humble the exalted and exalt the humble. The point here is that the name will be of the Lord is to be lifted up. We are standing at a critical point in history, in prophecy. One thing you could say, and just from what we're saying, is God is real. God is real. He is exact. He's precise. He's in charge. He's on the throne. And I am asked, what does the future hold? What does the future hold? Judgment or revival? I answer, it can be both. Revival can even come out of judgment. And God can touch a remnant in the midst of judgment. What does it tell us? If the hour is late, we must take our time more seriously. And if the time for getting right is not tomorrow, it's now. The message of eternal life is now. If we're going to spread the word, it's now. When the night comes, it's the time of the watchmen. And the watchmen can, or the watchwomen cannot help save the city if they're part of it. They have, you have to be above the city on the walls at the watchtower with God. The mystery is real. God is real. What days are these? These are the days of Isaiah, when the nation is in defiance of God. And the, these are the days of Jeremiah, when the righteous have to stand and go against the flow. The day, these are the days of Ezekiel, when the watchman must sound the trumpet because the blood is on his head. And these are the days of Elijah. We sing it. These are the days of Elijah. Oh, that's great. But the days of Elijah were days of apostasy when they were persecuting God's people, but God's people stood strong. These are the days of Elijah when God's people stand. And so if these are the days of Elijah, we must be the Elijahs of the day. And challenge, stay and do not be, do not compromise, do not be intimidated by political correctness, but stand up for God and speak his word and do not be ashamed of the gospel. And say to the world around you, if Baal is God, serve him. But if the Lord is God, then serve him. Choose this day whom you shall serve. But we have to choose in our own life. If we're going to say that to the world, we got to be totally chosen for God. We have the call. What must we do? What does it teach us? Elijah, be aware of the times. What the Bible said is coming true. And whatever is not grounded on God shall be shaken. Ground yourself all the more strongly in God. Be all the more in the Word of God, all the more submitted to it. Commit to being all the more deeply plugged into God. Be plugged, more and more plugged out of being dependent on the world. Break that dependency and be dependent on God as Elijah was. Determine that no matter what happens, no matter what the majority does, no matter what the government does, no matter what the cost, no matter what happens, you will stand with God. I, you have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, though none go with me, still I will follow. Ready yourself. Do not fear, but be confident. Know that no matter what it looks like, you are still on the winning side. Remember that none of these things, even all hell, can stop the will of God. 
These are times, the times that produces the greatest testimonies of those who will stand. They'll become great. Let it become great in you. Don't live on the defense. Live on the offense before our, because our kingdom is always advancing even in the midst. Impact the world. Spread the gospel. You know, remember, you are living in biblical times. Act biblical. You know, you know if the dark is getting darker, the lights have to get brighter. If the bad is going from bad to worse, then the good is to become great. And so even with a darkness, we, we got to shine, either for revival or persecution, but either way, we've got to shine. You know, they say, well, you know, I want to be safe. I want to be safe. Should I build a bomb shelter? Well, I can't tell you that, but I can't. People are coming to me for financial advice. That's not me. But I can tell you this. The word for safety is Yeshua. Yeshua is safety. Get in, get everything in him, and you'll be saved. Get everything in him. The safest spot to be is in the will of God. Get anything that's not in the will of God, get it in in your life. Anything that's not, get it out that's not, get the God's will in. You want Bible days? You've got it. You want the days of Elijah? You've got it. You want the book of Acts? You can get it. You want the end times? You have it. It's here. Go with God. Go against the flow no matter what. No matter what. For the eyes of the Lord search the entire earth looking for the one whose heart is completely his. You be that one. You be that people and God will lift you up. It's time to get real for God. Time to get serious for God. Truly serious. You know, and the ultimate part, the ultimate thing, I don't want you to fear. Because if you're not in God, fear. Get in God and you won't have to fear. But if you're in God, don't fear. Just get it right. Get right with God. And the ultimate thing is this. Remember this, people of God. Remember, when you look at what is around you, and it sometimes looks like you're on the losing side, listen, remember, you are of the nation. If you're born again, you are of the commonwealth of Israel. You are born again, grafted into the nation, the kingdom of Israel. And what is it about Israel? Egypt tried to stamp them out. Assyria tried to wipe them out. Babylon tried to destroy them. Rome tried to crush them. The Nazis tried to annihilate them. The Soviet Union tried to oppress them. But, 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 Egypt has fallen. Assyria is no more. Babylon is gone. Rome has fallen. The Third Reich is gone. The terrorists will be gone. They've fallen. They've fallen. But the nation of Israel lives because the God of Israel lives because the people of Israel will live. I'm Yisrael Achai because Messiah of Israel lives and you will live as you follow him. You'll prevail in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Lamb of God and the King of this Praise God. We praise you, Father. Hallelujah. We praise you, Father. Hallelujah. We bless your name tonight. We, you are real. You are awesome. You are here in our midst. You are here in our midst, and we praise you. Lord, anoint your people. Strengthen your people. Empower your people. We will do your will. We will follow you, Father. Lord, anoint us that we might stand in the days to come. We praise you, Father. We bless you tonight. Father, have your way in every life. We commit to you. Whatever has been in our life that shouldn't be there anymore, we say goodbye. We say no more. We we say we make the change we close the door we lock the key we will put it aside and Lord we ask that what is called for our life that is not yet there but you we know you're calling us that victorious life we take it we say yes we say here I am Lord send me we say let the mantle come on my life because I want to glorify you with my life father make your people strong let their, your people here in Kentucky be a light be strong in the days to come we praise you we bless you we thank you and Lord we just want to glorify the name of Yeshua Jesus the anointed king of all things Lord we praise you tonight oh father we bless you we praise you and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a blessing right now if we can have if I can have that that talit that's in the bag somewhere if I can have that yeah just the just the yeah and I'm gonna give you the blessing I'll go out there, I'll meet you there, but with the books, but I'll, I want to give you the blessing. Thank you, my brother. I'll give you the blessing that was given. You know, in ancient times, my fathers would give this blessing to the people of Israel from the temple. And I'm from that line with Aaron, and you are the people of God. And so I want to give you this blessing in the name of Messiah.
If you will close your eyes and lift up your hands and receive as from the Lord. In the language of Jesus. Adonai Panavalecha Vayish Merecha Yaher Adonai Panavalecha Adonai, panavalecha, v'yasem lecha, sham, shalom. The Lord bless your life, and the Lord keep you in the center of his hand. The Lord God cause his face to shine on your life, on every part, on your home, on your secret place, on all things. And the Lord pour out his grace upon you. The Lord God lift up the glory of his shining upon you. Let his shining fall upon every part, every dark part be lit up, and every light part shine. And the Lord give to you his shalom, life, fullness, blessings, all the blessings of his love. Bashem Yeshua, in the name of Jesus the Messiah. Or Haolam, the light of the world, Uchvod Yisrael, and the glory of Israel, the Ari, Yahuda, and the lion of the tribe of Judah, in his holy name, and all his people say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Love you. Receive today's sermon on DVD or CD or become a monthly partner and receive each sermon this season on CD, DVD, plus find out more on our Facebook page and stay up to date with what's happening in Prophecy. Join me next week as we look further into unlocking the Revelation Code.